Hey, hi everyone. Welcome. Today is Saturday, November 1st, 2014. It's 1 o'clock and we've come together in our virtual web seminar to discuss and understand more about the topic of autism. This session is being recorded, however, no names will be visible in the recordings. We encourage you all to visit us at our YouTube channel, and we are at youtube.com, UTA New Teachers. I am putting the link in the chat window, so we hope you can subscribe to our channel and see our archived videos. These are our opinions and suggestions. This session today is hosted by Peggy Simmingson, Amber Brown, and Denise Collins, all faculty at the University of Texas at Arlington. Do you want to say hello, Dr. Brown? Hello. I'm just sitting here in my home office going through paperwork waiting for us to start. So <laughs> I got distracted, <laughs> sorry. No, that's OK. Hi, OK. We'll keep going. Dr. Brown and I will take turns hosting the session today. However, some of Dr. Denise Collins' ideas are included here. So again, these are our opinions, and the ideas in the series represent our own viewpoints and perspectives, and they do not necessarily reflect the views of UT Arlington. And our goal is for you to learn more about crucial topics. This topic actually came up in our discussion of what do people really need to know in the classroom? And this is a topic that needs more discussion. And so we include some tips, too, for your learning. You can ask questions and type comments throughout the entire session. We'll be monitoring the chat window. You can also ask questions at the end if you think of something. You might want to take notes and make a list of things to Google or look up later. Also, check back on SlideShare, where we will post the PowerPoint. And you can click later go back and look at the slides and information that, uh, at your leisure. And we'll check the chat window to see what you guys are thinking. So this is part of our broader initiative to support new teachers. The purpose of the Teacher Induction Project is building digital community for current students and alumni of the department as well as new teachers beyond UT Arlington. So let others know about these real world topics. Again, um, visit us on YouTube, like us on Facebook, and take note of our SlideShare channel. Our upcoming webinar is November 22nd, and an engineering professor, Dr. Dan Popa, is going to talk about Zeno, the robot that he uses to help intervention with autistic children. And it's, he's a really interesting robot. And you can Google him to look him up. Um, his name is Dan Popa at UT Arlington. We'll also pick up and finish our book club discussion on our book club book. And it is, I'm holding it up here, The Autistic Brain by Temple Grandin. It's a pretty quick read, and she's so interesting. She has another book um, called Thinking in Pictures, My Life with Autism. She's an animal um, professor, animal scientist. So as a scientist, those of you in that field might be interested in her perspective as well. And she's in Colorado. So we highly recommend the books by Temple Grandin. And so tell us where you are. Go ahead and type it again in the chat window or put an X. And I think many of us are from the same region, and that's OK. So we should probably just make a big Texas map. <laughs> so let us know where you are. OK, great. All over the Metroplex. Awesome. OK, thanks for doing our icebreaker and joining us. In just a second, we're going to do a poll question. And the polling option is next to the hand. It's where you did the green check before. It's in the participants window. And so our polling question is this, where are you in your teaching career? I am currently a pre-service teacher A, B, first through third year teacher, and UTA graduate, C, first through third year teacher, and non-UTA graduate. 
D fourth or up year teacher or E faculty or none of the above. So go ahead and vote now A, B, C, D or E using the drop down tool next to the hand. We'll give you guys a few seconds to vote. So we have some grads and mostly new teachers, and obviously Dr. Brown and I are faculty. So let me display those um, polling results. I'm going to give us a few more seconds to vote. OK, so there we go. So great. And I think most of us said this topic is new, so we hope you learn a lot. Let's go ahead and um, use the letter tool. It's the fourth. But the fourth button down on that little skinny thing next to the chat window, or you can use the chat window and tell us what you already know. Type what comes to mind when you hear the word autism, and you can type in the box below on the slide. You can click the letter A. Um, someone put spectrum. Yes, autism is on the spectrum. By the way, you can make, you can change the size of your font if you're typing on the slide. Feel free to type in the chat window as well if you're on a mobile device. So let's give us a few, a little bit of time to type, and then we'll see what people have to say. And if you're not sure, you can just put that as well. And welcome to everyone who's joining the session. OK, so we've got spectrum social struggles like need structure. Yes, we'll talk about that. Focus, we've got focus issues. Um, hyperactive, can be. Remember, every child's different. So some of these things do apply. Social and communication. We'll talk about speech and language today. Wide range of degrees. Yes, exactly. This idea that autism um, is on a continuum is really important. And if you think about it, much of education of what we learn is on a continuum. And so what we mean by that is there can be mild um, you know, cases where students have autism, moderate, and then you know, progressively um, more so than moderate. So yes, the idea of the spectrum is a key idea. Thank you, everyone, for contributing to our prior knowledge. So, Got kind of a lengthy definition here, but it's good to know all the details. So I'll go through, I'll read it out loud. Autism spectrum disorder is a range of complex neurodevelopment disorders characterized by social impairment, communication difficulties, and restricted repetitive and stereotype patterns of behavior. And that keyword there is range. Autistic disorder, sometimes called autism or classical ASD, is the most severe form of ASD, while other conditions along the spectrum include a milder form known as Asperger syndrome and childhood disintegra disintegrative disorder and pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified. And they call that PDD-NOS. Although ASD varies significantly in character and severity, it occurs in all ethnic and socioeconomic groups and affects every age group. So that's interesting. It cuts across cultures, groups, ages. Experts estimate one out of 88 children age 8 will have an ASD. And it's increasing in numbers as well, which we'll show on the next slide. And that's from Center for Disease Control. Males are four times more likely to have an ASD than females. Is that surprising? Another disorder um, uh, difficulty can be dyslexia. And it also seems to hit males a lot harder, more so in frequency than females. So that last sentence is, is interesting about the gender differences. Please feel free to leave comments 
in the chat window as we go along. Like if something surprises you or is interesting or resonates with what you know and have seen, please let us know in the chat window. Also, the frequency of diagnosis is increasing. And I'm curious and I'm wondering why this is. Um, is it because we have better tools to diagnose? Is it because we're becoming more sophisticated at screening and intervening? I do not know, but I have a link here. This would be something for you all to look into. Um, I think the gender differences aspect is really interesting and worthy of further investigation. And so actually, I do not know, Catherine. I'm not quite sure. I think it has to do with the more higher availability of diagnosis. I think it has to do with broader awareness of the issue and so on, more screening. But it's kind of um, an interesting question. So there's some details for you. And this is from US Department of Education. And I've linked the sources here so you can go back and look. So remember, it's says um, symptoms of autism spectrum disorder vary from one child, but generally there are two areas we're going to pay attention to. Social impairment, including difficulties with social communication. So that's kind of what we think of as children that really struggle to get across or communicate. But not only that, but struggle with interaction and knowing how to read body language and even the nonverbal aspects of communication beyond speaking. The other aspect of autism is the um, repetitive and stereotyped behaviors. So let's understand autism. How is it treated? And so there's different, and let me just look at the chat window before I go on. Dr. Brown um, offered some insight. One reason is mostly due to changing definition and diagnosis. And that's kind of what I was thinking too. Um, is it has to do with the ways we diagnose and who's included in the spectrum. Um, so some treatments, kind of, and Dr. Brown will elaborate more um, on educational interventions, but primarily educational and behavioral interventions. So the key here is we don't cure autism, um, but we can help with the symptoms that might interfere with day-to-day -day living. Um, for example, speech and language therapy can help children learn how to communicate in more effective ways. There are actually technologies that can help children. There are medications, and there are what um, the government characterizes as other therapies. Like, you know, there have been a variety of therapies and approaches. Um, we are more, most, in education, we're most familiar with the first one, educational and behavioral interventions, and that's going to be our focus today. And so just if, I'm not going to read all of these, but this is just for you to skim and know what are some issues with language development? What might be challenging for students with autism? So here are some indicators. And you can notice that these begin from a very early age. So if you look at the third one, young infants might be cooing and babbling, but then stop. And delayed language, developing language at a delayed pace can be an indicator. So speech and language really becomes a crucial area to observe and pay attention to when looking for signs. Um, learning to communicate using pictures or their own sign language. I think that's an interesting um, you know, aspect for children with autism. Something else that they may or may not do is repeat words or phrases they hear. And that's called echolalia. So when somebody says something and then they repeat it, and it, it, may, it may not have any significance, but it's something that, that is particular to autism. It can be. Remember, these vary with children. Have you seen these, or do these look recognizable to you, these characteristics with speech and language? I'm going to share some tips now from a speech and language therapist about working with students with autism. And so anyway, this slide, I think, is useful. These suggestions come from a speech and language therapist, Carol Medeiros. She's actually my mother. Um, and she has worked with children of all ages, from very young preschool children all the way up to very older, much older people. And she's, she has worked one-on-one -on -one with students that have um, autism. And she offers here her knowledge and advice for working with students. It's mostly grounded in a social, emotional context of providing a very highly supportive environment for students. That's step one. 
So I'll just read, kind of read through here. We would love it if you guys, if you have any comments on these suggestions, if you would type them in the chat window, like agree, you know, what, elaborate on our ideas here. So she shares, the autism spectrum disorders are describing different levels of functioning, usually within a social setting. At the foundation of speech utterances and body language is the social setting. Speech is socially based. I want the child to feel non-threatened and safe. And this is in speech therapy. To that endeavor, she sits side by side with the child who may have had difficulty making eye contact. This way, the spotlight of attention is reduced. What do you think about that? So sitting to the side of them versus sitting across I've heard that's good advice as well with any kind of subject where you don't want to feel like you're making the child like it's a confrontation. I've heard of that strategy in writing instruction. Like if you sit across from the child, it makes them feel like, oh my gosh, you're confronting me. I sort of want to shut down. But particularly with children with autism, making them feel safe and kind of I'm on your side, I'm here. I'm not going to threaten you. You don't have to make eye contact, because that can be stressful to have to make eye contact. Um, and she gives more advice. And I love this advice, because it's about, and then we've got a comment, it isn't the way most teachers address their students. I know. And you know, I know that in some cultures, even, making eye contact isn't um, part of their culture, even beyond our subject of autism. And so the whole eye contact thing really needs to be rethought, I think, depending on culture and depending on, you know, whether the student has characteristics of autism. Um, so another tip she suggests, and this should resonate with what you know, um, is building on a child's interest. And Ryan said in law enforcement, eye contact is used intentionally <laughs> to intimidate. It can be canted, especially if it's intense. Build on a child's interests, and this should resonate with us. So she says, I like to find out the child's interests, however narrow they may be. Dinosaurs, his pet, her shoes. Um, you know, some children are very interested in, in one particular thing when, when they have autism, Legos, rocks, etc. What especially holds the child's attention uh, visually? Following the child's interests, I may set up contingencies to obtain a desired picture or objects that are specifically interesting to the child. So she's following the child's lead. Visually attending is rewarded with the giving of the object, for example. So that's scaffolding. So and she notices they're paying attention to something, so she'll give it to them. And that's initiating that communication at, at that level. And then she'll work up from there. Then the criteria for rewards is up somewhat, but gradually. Again, starting where the child is at. The child with autism, like any child, needs to have something to say, a topic, a way to express it, talking, responding, drawing, signing, nodding, gestures, and a reason for expressing, to gain attention, to get the object. So those are all things to think about. And I like this, a way to express it. There's not just talking, sometimes drawing or gestures can be meaningful communications. And then I put in blue on the right some keywords she also shares. Acceptance, building on interests, the role of the family in getting to know more about the child. And then she talks about picture supports and then general encouragement. So acceptance of the child's repertoire of connecting is especially important in the beginning. The child in front of you may have been subject to critique and questioning. What do you think about that? So sometimes children are a little bit more shut down anyway because they've been criticized. Um, you may often find out the child's interest by asking family members. Ask about daily routine and names of family members. Pictures that the parents may have may provide conversations. For example, this is your dog. His name is blank while turning to the child. If there's no response, you can say it, Dexter. Naming of actions and nouns are first targets for your lesson plans for children with autism. And then she says, speech can reduce tension. Even one word responses or one word actions naming. Um, so, And then treating the children gently, of course. So, What do you guys think about these advice? this advice from a speech pathologist? Building on interests, acceptance, 
starting where they're at and uh, encouraging their visual attention, encouraging them to express themselves in the manner they feel comfortable with. So it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, it, it's again, it goes back to the social emotional part of learning, which we talked about in the last webinar. Dr. Collins really emphasizes that. And if you've had Dr. Collins, you know her approach is very nurturing. And this kind of goes with that nurturing approach. OK, um, I'm going to just wrap up my section by sharing some modifications. We talked a little bit about speech and language as a key component of, of working with students with autism. So you'll be working with the speech language pathologist at your school to get insight into how you can help and just t have conversations with them about kind of the things that you can do in the classroom to help. Anyway, um, also the instructional modifications, these are secondary level students and they come from a government study over nine years. It was a longitudinal study where they followed students through the secondary years and noticed what types of co accommodation they have. Um, look at the second one, additional time to complete assignments, 52%, more time in taking tests. These are kind of standard accommodations, I'm sorry, modifications that are made. Um, alternative tests is about half. Slower paced instruction, so a lot of it has to do with the pacing and the amount of time given to students. Shorter assignments, modified tests, modified grading. Tests read to students. I'm surprised it's not higher than that, but it's only 25%. And then modifications to physical aspects of classroom. I'm thinking that includes maybe they can work by themselves or have a more qu quiet environment. So any thoughts on these? These are general modifications. They do look like ones you might see for ADHD. They have longer, allow for longer processing time. And then here's what we call learning supports. And so um, most students did receive some type of learning support and monitoring of progress by a special education teacher. So they will track their needs individually. Um, a teacher's aid or instructional or personal assistant, the, those, those kind of helpers aren't always available. It might be you in the classroom. But don't be intimidated, you, you need a team of people to, you know, become more knowledgeable. You're not going to be on your own completely in the classroom. And so, but if you do have support like an aide, that's helpful to you and to the student to meet their individual needs. Um, more frequent feedback. This is always important for students who need sort of intervention is more frequent feedback. Um, learning strategies and study skills assistance, peer tutor and self-advocacy, helping the students to advocate for themselves. That's, that's it for my part. Do you have any comments or questions so far before Dr. Brown shares more on accommodations? Any thoughts? Okay, we'll keep going. Dr. Brown. Hello. <laughs> okay, most of my accommodations are going to come from two places. I, while I was doing my master's degree, worked with two different school districts. It's what's called an in-home trainer for students with autism. Um, that means that I was a go-between between school and home on um, making sure that practices and supports and things that were working at school teaching the parents how to do that at home, and then sometimes it was vice versa. There were some things that the parents were doing really well at home, and then they would get to school and they would have, you know, problems, and I could help the classroom teacher um, implement some of the things that were working at home with that student. So another resource that I am using is this textbook, or it's not really a textbook, but it's this book. Can you see? Try to make sure you can see. It's called You're Gonna Love This Kid. And it has, it's really thick. I don't know if you can tell. It's a pretty big book. But it has a lot of really practical and um, hands on strategies if you have a child in your classroom that has autism. So it's, um, it's really useful in that, in that regard. So we're gonna, like I said, start out talking about just some specific academic 
accommodations. I know that um, Dr. Simmingson talked about a few of these, but one of the most important um, things to think about it, with a child with autism is the environment. It needs to be extremely structured. Um, you have to have things in the same place. You have to have, have pretty consistent schedules. Um, if a schedule is going to change, they need prior knowledge. They're not really good at handling last minute changes to a schedule. Um, one thing that's really helpful is a visual schedule. I have a picture of one of those in a minute. Um, but basically, I used a visual schedule with the students that had Velcro. So if the time, if, if something changed, like on Tuesdays and Thursdays, they may go to art, but on Monday, Wednesdays, they may go to PE. So you could substitute art and PE, and it's something that is still flexible, but consistent for the students. Um, using timers, giving them warnings, like I said, if there's going to be a transition, letting them know you have five minutes, and having even a, a there's timers on smart boards in all the classrooms if you want to use this as just a general. It doesn't have to be specifically just for autistic children to give them warnings. But you can also put, you know, little timers on their desk so they can see it clicking down and know that there's a change about to happen and they can start preparing for it inside of themselves. Um, I think we talked about increased time. Also, breaking down directions and tasks into small little chunks. That ends up being a really important um, skill and really important thing for students with autism. You may start out with just having to tell them one thing at a time to do. And it seems a little cumbersome, but um, you know, once they can handle doing one thing at a time, then you can add a second thing to that. And I'll have, have an example of aid to help with that here in a second. So here's the, oh, the picture kind of has a glare on it because it's one that I actually took of a, of a schedule that a classroom teacher I worked with put together. And you can see she's using a pocket chart and she can um, pull out art and put in PE on the days they go to PE. Or if there's an assembly, she can put that in there. Um, but you notice she has the word and then she also has the picture. So it's really important for, I mean, um, for any student, but specifically for autistic students, they tend to think in pictures. They tend to be very visual. So it's really important for them to see the word because, yes, high-functioning autistic students will learn how to read. I had students that I worked with that were in high school, and they both read very well. Um, they didn't read well enough to pass the exit exam, so they did age out, but they read well enough to function and probably read at about a fourth or fifth grade level, which is functional in society. Um, so this is one example of a, a visual chart. I like the pocket chart because it was really easy. You can Again, you can also do this on just a piece of poster board and have Velcro so you can change things out. This is a, another example of a schedule, and this is um, a schedule where the child is starting to take more control of their schedule, so it's kind of the next step, you know, that scaffolding idea. So you can let them, these are the five things they need to complete that morning, and you can let them fit that in where, you know, it makes sense, and it can be anything. This is just an example. but. As they get older and they start taking more, um, you want them to start taking more control of their schedule, this is another way to do that. All right. Um, this is for giving directions. This is a really good accommodation for scaffolding that idea of giving directions. So this is a first, then board. A lot of times students with autism will really focus on an activity or um, something that they really enjoy doing. It's called stimming, but the stimming has a purpose. So the swinging, the spinning, the um, repetitive hand movements, all of those things help calm and soothe them, and it feels um, 
comforting to them. Sometimes it, we had a corner where they could just pile pillows around them, and having the pillows all on top of them was very soothing. But whatever that activity that motivates them, like this is what they're living to go do, this is what they're focused on, it's kind of like that's the then, that's the reward, but they have to complete this other activity first. So again, you can have a first then board just at their desk, and you can have these little car picture cards with Velcro so that you can change them out. Um, so you can have, you know, first math, then swing. Um, you can change it out to say, you know, first reading book, and then you can, you know, play with Play-Doh, whatever their reward for, for doing that activity is. And so, like I said, this works really good specifically to have like a little chart at their, a, a little, just a little piece of chart at their desk. You will need to, um, just a note, laminate everything because <laughs> it will get used and manipulated. So I actually, when I was doing this work, bought a little hand mani uh, laminator for my personal use because I had to laminate so many things. All right. Um, these are some more kind of different academic accommodations. Lots and lots of graphic organizers, checklists, charts, you know, anything. I'm not good at drawing with this little thing on the board. Um, so anything that you can visually organize for them. Remember, autistic children are very uh, visual learners. So anytime you can visualize a task, breaking it up into pieces and visualize it for them, it really, really helps. Um, having a scribe or help, having someone help them take notes. Um, in the students I worked with that were in high school, one of the children, one of them, not both of them, but one of them had an aide that took notes for them. That was part of her job is she took notes for this child and then printed them and gave them to him. So that was, you know, a, a, an accommodation that he had. You can also just provide a printed copy if it's a lot of information. Um, in young, for the younger grades, this isn't necessary as much because you're not going to be over, you know, you're not lecturing and giving them a lot of information at one time like maybe in an older grade. So, but think about breaking up the notes into smaller chunks and things like that. All right. More than just accommod um, academic accommodations, um, if you have any questions about academic accommodations, you know, um, Anne-Marie asks if they can be weaned out over time, and that's the idea is hopefully if you have a child that is, you know, fairly high functioning and you're, the, the goal is that they will eventually be able to transition, um, you know, to a job and be self-sufficient in some way, you'd work on that independence and so you would take away some of the, the scaffolds. The high school students I had did not use visual schedules anymore. Um, they had a schedule um, written, you know, just their high school schedule written in their notebooks for them, and they kept kept it so they could refer to it, but they didn't have the same type of visual schedule. So they were able to learn their schedule, know what they needed to do, know where they needed to go without having that visual schedule in front of them. They had them when they were younger. So yes, that's the goal. Um, and for most autistic children, you know, especially the ones that are high functioning that you will have in your classroom, the goal is that they will transition um, into a job and independent living someday. That's if you, any of you that are going to work with high school students, that's one of the main goals once they're in high school is in your IEP meetings when you are working with the parents and the um, school staff, they will talk about um, a transition plan, and that is something that becomes a really important part of, of their education is preparing them to be independent. Okay, um, social-emotional accommodations become really important because a lot of times the autist an autistic child is very smart, um, especially a high-functioning autistic child. They are going to be able to read. They are going to be able to do math. 
they're going to you know be able to do the academic skills with some support and and and, and scaffolding. It's the social emotional um, breakdowns, I guess you could say, that that sometimes can be what hold them up. They can be overwhelmed with something on the social emotional level to where they're not able to pay attention and, and focus on the academics. So you have to think about that because we want to really, you know, we're, our goal is to educate the whole child and so the social emotional aspect is important. Um, having sensory breaks, this just means if they're in a, a sensory break for an autistic child can mean different things, but most common it is that they just need to get away and be by themselves for a second. It's, you know, the constant companionship and constant talking and constant noise can kind of override their system. Um, one of the things that I learned with working with autistic children is things that we tune out that we don't even notice anymore, like the hum of the fluorescent lights or the air conditioner system turning off and on and things like that are front and center in their in their attention. Like they can't stop listening to that hum of the electric light, you know, the fluorescent light. So they can't get that um, you know, sound out of the they can't just push it to the back of their mind and, and go on. It becomes like right front and center. So they're overwhelmed with sensor sensors, you know, sensory stimulation all the time. So having breaks you know, having a place where they can go in the classroom to um, be by, on their own and not it be a place that they can just go to if they feel like they're about to, you know, they're starting to feel overwhelmed. Um, this might require them going quite a bit at first and then you start weaning them down to say, okay, when you start feeling like you need to go, you know, raise your hand, and just little things so they can start, you know, trying to wean themselves off of it, but it really helps for them to get a sensory break before having a meltdown than dealing with a meltdown after it's happening. Um, the occupational therapist, most autistic children will be working with an occupational therapist as well as a speech therapist um, in the classroom. Uh, are in the school, they may be pulled out of the classroom to do that, but they can help you as well with what type of sensory break that child may need. Like I said, sometimes it's, I had one little boy that cushions were just, he would go over to this little reading corner and just pile all these cushions on top of them, and he would create like a, just a nest of cushions that he was underneath, and it really seemed, he would, stay there for five minutes and then he would be calm and he would come back to the class and, and, and be good. So sometimes it's the swings at recess or sometimes it's just a quiet area. So it really depends. Parents are great. They know what calms their child down. They've been dealing with this for a lot longer than you have, so they know. Um, this is an idea for encouraging them to interact socially. So while we want to give them breaks and acknowledge that they need downtime and alone time, we also want to start encouraging them in uh, to socialize. Um, you know, not pushing, but just encouraging. So this is one idea. You can give them these little cards and they can plan out who they're going to socialize with. Um, so today it says, I will play with and we will play. and you can even let them plan this with the child that they're playing, you know, if they want to play with, with Tommy, you know, then bring Tommy over and say, Tommy, what would you like to play with Johnny today? And let them plan this together. And then they get a reward. There's always, you know, rewards are very um, beneficial. So for this one, it would be I play with my friend for five minutes, then I can be on the swing. So there's a give and take. They know if they do this certain behavior that's good for them, but they may not really enjoy it, they get, they get the reward. All right. Um, social scripts and stories are another important um, aspect 
with children with autism. And, and what I mean by social script is it helps them prepare for an activity that's going to be different. So um, like changes in routine, field trips, assemblies, fire drills. Fire drills are nightmares for kids with autism. I can't, every single kid with autism I've worked with, fire drills were like their biggest fear when it came to going to school. One, you know, it's loud. Everyone's piling out of this building at one time, and it, so it, they're bumping into each other, and it's crowded. Um, it's just a, it, it's something that, that you have to prepare them for. Um, so if you have a child with autism, what I would definitely, you know, yes, fire drills are supposed to be drills, surprises, but make sure they let you know when they're going to happen so you can prepare the child for them. So I had an example of a social script on here. So here's one for asking for help. Um, and it, it's a script you write with the child and you read it with them and you go over it with them and you let them practice. If they're very verbal, they can role play with you this, this concept. So this one is asking for help. And so, you know, sometimes I don't know what I need to do. It's okay. When this happens, I can ask my teacher and other adult. That's the right thing to do. They'll be happy to help me. And it sounds really simple, but um, it prepares them socially for this situation that might come up and they wouldn't know how to handle otherwise. So let's see. There's a couple. This, the book that I was telling you about has lots and lots of examples of social scripts. So if you're curious about what those look like, and um, you can get some ideas from them. But it also needs to be something you work on with the child as well. So they can put some of their own words into it if the child's verbal. Um, even if the child's not verbal, you can use a social script. And one of the things that I just realized that um, we didn't talk about is strategies for communication when they're not verbal. So I'll come back to that in just a minute. All right, um, functioning of functions of behavior. Like I said, this actually holds true with all children, but behaviors have a reason. And though it seems like kids just spontaneously do crazy things, and part of that is because they're impulsive, but typically if it's a um, disruptive behavior, there's some kind of reason for it. So um, in order to change a behavior, you've got to figure out why they're doing this behavior. That's the first step. So the four main functions of behavior for autistic children, there could be something physical going on that you don't, you don't see. They may want to escape. Like I said, they're over, you know, overloaded sensory. Um, they may just not be able to pay attention. It may be an attention problem. Or sensory, like I said, something um, Physically, they're very sensitive to touch. Um, you know, certain clothing might be touching them the wrong way, things like that. It, it, I have one little boy that um, his shoes drove him crazy, and he would take them off constantly. <laughs> so we were constantly having to put his shoes back on him. All right, tangible. Like I said, here's some examples. Um, they want to, They need something, but they don't know how to ask for it or um, and, you know, they just have a meltdown because they didn't get the one that they wanted. So giving them choices, you know, like maybe offering, and this, I guess, it works with not just autistic children, but, um, you know, letting them, like giving them a choice between two colors of marker and letting them pick one helps. Um, and then also, you know, not reinforcing the behavior by just giving them the one they wanted. But again, giving them another choice, I'll let you choose another marker. And I'll go back. This is going to be posted. So if you have questions and if somebody asks us what the last one was, oops, sorry, I went back too far. It's sensory, but we'll go back. This will be posted so you can go back and have this um, in your, uh, to reference in the future if you'd like to. Attention, again, with all children, Sometimes they misbehave just because they want attention. So you have to really say that 
um, see what the, the purpose of that attention was. Do they want, um, do they just need someone to get something for them? Do they want something, you know, do they want to be included? And the only way they know how to do that is to do something inappropriate and have everyone laugh at them. And they just, they think, well, I'm being included, but it's not maybe appropriate. So reinforcing when they are on task and do, getting attention in the correct ways, like raising their hand or, or socially engaging, and then not reinforcing or ignoring the inappropriate ways they're getting attention is really effective. All right, so with any behavior, like we said, you need to identify, we call it the ABCs. And that's the antecedent, or is there something that um, triggers that behavior? the behavior itself, and then what was the consequence, what happened afterwards. So when you think about breaking up behavior like that, it really is effective in the classroom. So once you've recognized that, you know, th th this is why they're doing this behavior, but how do we start reducing it into something more appropriate? So the plan should be the opposite of the behavior. For example, if the child's function is to get attention, then the plan should involve ignoring or not giving the student attention for the inappropriate behavior. Trying to recognize the cause, figuring out that underlying cause is super important. So for example, if it seems like right before lunch, the child is cranky and misbehaving and, you know, maybe they're uh, uncooperative and you know, not participating or not doing what they need to do, but it always seems to be right before lunch, maybe it's because they're hungry and they don't know how to, to handle that. So maybe having a snack mid-morning can totally eliminate that bad behavior that's happening right before lunch. And it's something really simple, but, you know, oh, well, if we just have a little, you know, take 10 minutes to have a snack time, then we avoid this whole meltdown right before lunch. All right. Um, consistency is key. I think any of you that have been in the classroom longer than two seconds <laughs> realize that you have to be consistent. Um, everyone working with that child needs to have the same plan, so they need to reinforce the same behavior. So when you're creating a behavior plan, you're not going to do it alone. You're going to talk with, you know, you the speech therapist, the occupational therapist, um, the special education teacher, maybe the PE teacher, um, art teacher, whoever works with this child needs to be in the loop so that, um, you know, everyone can reinforce behaviors in the same way. Um, the go person or leader, typically um, that's going to be probably the either you or the special education teacher. Um, just because you're the ones that will spend the most time with the child, typically it's whoever's spending the most time during the day with that child should be the leader, in my opinion, I guess. It doesn't, maybe it doesn't always work that way. And behaviors often get worse before they get better. So the child may kind of uh, lash out more or have a, a reaction to like, oh, no, I'm going to do whatever I want. And it gets worse before it actually starts getting better. So you can't um, give up too quickly on a strategy. You need to stick with it for a few days, maybe a few weeks, before you make a determination that, oh, that's just not working. Because it's for any child, not just autistic children, it typically gets worse before it gets behavior, gets better. All right, so once you've gotten a plan, and um, remember, it needs to include rewards. You can have tokens, you can have stickers, you know, they, they get so many stickers and they get a reward. They get to go spend extra time out on the swings or they get to go, um, you know, play with the, the, this, the Lego blocks or whatever their reward is, that currency that they really enjoy doing. Um, reinforcing a good behavior is always... I think the pref, you know, before a bad behavior comes is always preferable. Um, so just some little samples here of sticker charts. So once they, this one is a picture version, so 
they get so many stars, they get to free draw. Maybe that's their their behavior. Um, this is a a negative one where they're taking stars away. So if they have every time they do something inappropriate, they get a star taken away. They can earn. I personally, that's not my favorite one. I like to reinforce positive behaviors first, but it can work if there's a behavior you're trying to eliminate. So for example, if um, you know they're constantly uh, getting up and leaving the classroom, I had a child that would do that. They would just all of a sudden get up and run out the door, and and uh. So when they would stay, you know, with the teacher and be engaged doing what they're supposed to do, they would get to keep their stickers. But if they got up and ran out the door, they might take away a sticker. All right. Um, like I said, I don't want to just read all these, but there's some more strategies for behavior management plans, uh, especially high-risk situations. Those are the ones that you know in advance are going to cause a huge meltdown. Like I said, fire drills are one of those. You know that they're very sensitive and it might cause a meltdown. Um, sometimes it's something as simple as like lunch. Um, I had one child who just was really loud noises really, really bothered him. And eating lunch in the cafeteria can be pretty, you know, it can get loud and echoey even. It may not seem loud to us, but it, it's loud for them. So he had a pair of headphones that he wore. Um, that were noise canceling, just they weren't actually headphones, but like they look like headphones. And he wore those in the halls and at lunch to dampen out the noise and the meltdown stopped. So there's sometimes you can find what those high-risk situations are and plan for them. Like I said, transitions are another, another biggie. All right, there's some more tips, um, you know, your tone of voice, being clear and concise, and like I said, representing things visually when possible. Um, one of the things that I didn't, this is the reference for the book that I got a lot of this information that from and I actually used when I was working with kids as a reference. Um, one of the things I didn't mention is communication systems. Um, a lot of times this will be set up by the speech teacher, but a lot of children with autism, before they're verbal, work do really well with communication cards. Um, and it's basically just little pictures of what they might need and what they might want. Um, and I was looking through my information, and I don't have any left. I mean, I just left them with the kids when I wasn't doing that anymore. But if you look up PECS, and it's, it's called Picture enhanced, I can't spell and talk at the same time, communication. Like I said, ignore the spelling because I can't spell and talk. But it's called a PEC system. And it basically just means that you find little pictures to represent different actions, different wants, different parts of routines. So you might have a picture of a toilet for when they need to go to the bathroom. You might have a picture of, um, you know, a child like holding their head and having a pained look on their face for if they have a headache, if that's something that happens to them pretty frequently. You might have a picture of, uh, you know, the swing when they want to go swing, you know, if that's what they're wanting to do. So you just you have all these little pictures and they're only like one inch by one inch. and they either can point to the picture that they're referring to, or they can, using Velcro, they can um, pull several of them out of a, you know, I kept them on a, on like cardstock with Velcro, and put them in little ring binders, and they could pick the one they wanted and put it at the front to tell me what they were communicating. Um, yeah, like I said, I, I was trying to remember everything I wanted to say and keep it short, and I forgot I was going to show you a picture of those. But Google the PEC system for communicating with children with autism, and you'll find lots and lots of information. Um, like I said, it doesn't have to be, it can be pictures. I would go to their house and just with my camera take pictures of things at their house 
that were familiar to them and take pictures of things in the classroom that were familiar and then just print them in little one-inch squares, laminate them and cut them out and put them on cardboard or on cardstock with a little ring binder and they could use those to communicate um, before they're verbal. This works really well, like I said, with pre-verbal. Uh, yeah, there are apps. that I worked before the day of apps. Like I said, it's about 10 years ago when I did this work. So you're right, Ryan, that there are apps that do this, do this now. Um, uh, and back then, they didn't even, like, the children that I worked with in high school had, had like, their, they had a watch that had calendar and it was kind of like a Blackberry or something like that, but their watch had a calendar and things like that in it. And there was this big debate at some of their IEP meetings of whether they could have that technology in the classroom. And it was just like ridiculous now if you think about that. Now, most high schools give them laptops or, or tablets or things that, to all students to carry with them. And we had this big debate whether they could have these digital electronic watches. Um, so yeah, apps would be really a really good way of doing that with children these days too. But any type of picture that they can point to is a form of communication. It may not be verbal, but they're able to communicate a need or a want to you, and that's a huge step. That's that's a, a huge, huge goal for children with autism, to be able to express a need or a want, even if it's just pointing to a picture. So. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Thanks. Dr. Brown. We're going to kind of wrap things up, you guys. I am sending you through the webinar a file. If you're on the if you're on a mobile device, email me, um, and we will also post these links on our Facebook page. But they're just the, a reminder that all these resources will and their link to the recording will be posted on our SlideShare channel. I'm just going to read a couple of quotes that. Dr. Collins has suggested, and let me turn the video on. We may go over a couple minutes. So this book is The Autistic Brain by Temple Grandin, and it's really, really awesome. She has some great TED Talk video clips, too, if you just Google her on YouTube. And she says, um, label locked, she's against labels. She says, label locked thinkers want answers. This kind of thinking can do a lot of damage. A label can become the thing that defines them. It can easily lead to what I call a handicap mentality. Um, she says, the educator's job, the role of education in society is to ask, well, what is she like? Instead of ignoring deficits, you have to accommodate them. But if you really want to prepare kids to participate in the mainstream of life, you have to do more than accommodate their deficits. You have to figure out ways to exploit their strengths. And I think that's key here, is not just modification, but building on strengths and building on what students are good at as well. And she says, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying autism is a great thing and all people with autism should just sit down and celebrate our strengths. Instead, I'm suggesting if we can recognize realistically on a case-by-case -case basis what an individual's strengths are, we can better determine the future of the individual. And then um, she talks about schools. It's also important for schools to let math whizzes do math in their own style. If they can do math in their heads, don't tell them you have to show their work. Let them do it in their heads. So that's kind of a difficult position to take in some schools. but she suggests kind of, you know, letting students work how they work. And fortunately, today's educational system is letting these kids, and she, you know, picture thinkers down, it's phasing out hands-on classes. And she actually has this book where she talks about how she thinks in pictures. It's really interesting. Thinking in pictures, my life with autism. I got these at half-price <clears throat> half books. So next time you're there, you might look. And I think they were in the education section under, like, special needs or something. Um, okay, great. So we hope you can join our book club. Um, and I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Brown, and she'll tell you a bit, a bit about our final resources. All right. So again, the book club, um, oh, here's a link to a TED Talk that Temple Grandin has done. Um, she is a fascinating, fascinating person. Um, so if you 
you know, are interested in this topic at all, you'll really find her interesting. Like I said, she has a doctorate degree in um, animal husbandry and has kind of revolutionized the way, it uh, sounds kind of harsh, but the way slaughtering of cattle <laughs> works. Um, there's also a movie about her life on HBO, if you're interested. I watched it. I, I watched it and cried, and it was it was amazing. All right. Is it on yeah. Netflix? Um, it's on Amazon Prime. Oh, okay. If it's not on, a, on, if you don't have HBO, it's on Amazon Prime. I didn't find it on Netflix. Um, you can join our discussion by going to um, joining Goodreads, and you click on this link, and it will take you to the UTA New Teacher Book Club discussion. Um. It's basically just posting, I've posted a few questions and you can respond to and, um, you know, just thoughts and comments that you have as you're reading the book and responding to thoughts and, and ideas we had. Um, we really want to encourage this. I know that you have, you know, those of you that are my students, you have a lot going on. But this is a kind of a recreational book to read. It's, it's, she, it's more like just listening to her story. It's not a lot of... Um, it's not reading like reading a textbook. It's just really interesting. On November 22nd, we will wrap up the book club discussion. So I'm going to take kind of some highlights of the discussion that we did on Goodreads and review them and maybe further discuss. So I'm really hoping that our last webinar session will be more of a discussion, not just one of us talking a whole lot like it has been this time. But it will be more of a back and forth discussion um, even if you haven't read the book and maybe you just watch the movie or watch some of her TED Talks, you can still participate in the last session as we wrap up this idea of autism. And then plus we'll have our guest uh, speaker with his little robot that I'm really excited to see too. Here's the, some other resources, TED Talks, the feature films, and then um, I'm going to kind of skip this part, Peggy, since we're kind of running out of time. Sounds good. So ponder this question. <laughs> I want to get to the last, and I will ponder that for more. You can go back to those for more information. I'm wanting to get to the webinar survey. Um, we want to make these webinars really valuable, not only for our current students, for our past students, um, for any teacher in the Metroplex or anywhere else that joins us. We want to make sure that we are doing the best job we can do. So we ask that you complete this short survey. If you click on this link, um, Dr. Simmonson just put it in the chat window as well, it will take you to a, just a really quick survey about this webinar, you know, what we did well, what you think we could have improved on, um, future topics, things like that, just a really quick survey. Um, and we'd really love to get all of your feedback on that. And that is all I have for today, yeah. Dr. Simmingson. Thanks for doing the survey. It really is short. And also type something that stood out to you in the, ses in the session today. And we're so glad you joined us. All right.